what I used to get were a lot of people who couldn't commit to that one night a week, a physical course. Maybe it was because they had kids and they needed the flexibility to stay home or go at their own pace. Perhaps it was people who traveled a lot for business. I'll get lots of people checking in from hotel rooms and using the mini bar and <laughs> taking my courses that way. But now it's a much broader swath of people who are looking to take these courses online. And I think it's because they had to get over the mental hurdle that taking wine classes online is something that can be not only effective, but it can be as or more enjoyable than in person. There's some things, of course, we can't replace about in-person tasting, but there are so many more advantages to online courses, whether it is that flexibility or the ability to connect with people around the world who share your passion. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 134. What's my advice for those considering a wine career? Maybe that's you. How did my biggest career regret happen before I became a wine writer? How has my father's alcoholism influenced my relationship with wine? How has the pandemic impacted online wine courses? And most importantly, can you pair ketchup chips with wine? In this episode of the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast, we're turning the tables and Susie Berry, who hosts the terrific Wine Blast podcast with her husband, Peter Richards, is interviewing me. In the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of our conversation, how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, where you can find me on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m., including this evening and next week. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 134. Now on a personal note, before we dive into the show, I was sitting here at my desk this morning, hearing the birds outside my window live tweeting. <laughs> I'm writing a segment for CTV television on pairing books and bottles for summer. That reminded me, I don't often mention my previous books to you. So if you are looking for a summer read, might I suggest Unquenchable, A Tipsy Search for the World's Best Bargain Bottles. This is a romp around the world's wine regions from Argentina to South Africa with stories about doing weird things with witty winemakers like tango dancing and shark diving as we and you learn about wine. It's available in paperback or as an ebook from any online bookstore on this planet. My first book, Red, White and Drunk All Over, A Wine-Soaked Journey from Grape to Glass, is also available as a paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Both books were named one of Amazon's best books of the year, and they both read a lot better when you're sipping on wine. I'll include links to where you can buy the books in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 134. Okay, on with the show. Canadian wine, crisps, and communication. 
That's what we're talking about in this episode of Wine Blast with me, Susie Barry, and my husband and fellow master of wine, Peter Richards. And we've even got some prizes to give away in the show today, haven't we? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, hello and welcome, everyone. How exciting to be doing something a bit different from our norm, mm. isn't it? Again, um, <laughs> it all stemmed from our fellow wine expert and podcaster, Natalie McLean, getting in touch and, and suggesting we do a bit of a a podcast swap, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, and we, we thought, well, this could be really interesting. So we've been on her show, Unreserved Wine Talk, and now she's coming on to ours. Mm. Uh, we had a great chat, uh, which we'll come on to in a second, about all kinds of things from how to get into wine as a second career, uh, being a woman in the world of wine, mm-hmm. um, regrets and challenges, the best Canadian wines to buy, mm. even, even pairing wine with ketchup crisps how hard is it to say ketchup crisps can you say that 10 <laughs> times it's really hard okay, to ready? say Go. ketchup crisps <laughs> ketchup i have to say it slowly i can't do it i think it. even the concept ketchup crisps. Is, is i think ketchup especially crisps. for you it's hard to get your mind uh, yeah ketchup i mean pairing wine with well it's hard to get my own ketchup crisps never mind pairing wine to them so I mean, that's agree. exactly where i want to go yep. of course you yeah know. Yeah, so in this episode, we are talking to Natalie McLean. Now, Natalie is a globally renowned wine communicator. She describes herself rather modestly as an enthusiastic amateur. And I suppose that is true in the true senses of both words. Um, She is a proper wine lover or amateur. Mm. And she's also a tremendously enthusiastic champion of wine. The amount of things she does and achieves in her working life is enough to make your head spin, <laughs> even without a glass of wine. Makes me want to have a lie down, to be honest. Then, <laughs> well, so does everything, doesn't a it? A lot of things do, yeah. It's just, crisps. <laughs> so, Natalie. No, no, crisps are the one thing that don't touch. It doesn't make me. But Natalie is based in Canada, and she runs that country's largest wine review website, which is nataliemclean.com. So she's at the cutting edge of wine and Canadian wine too, I think it's fair to say. She's an award-winning writer and author with two books to her name and just working on a third now, as far as we understand. Um, She writes exhaustively on food and wine pairings. She runs online wine courses and events um, and her newsletter goes out to about 270,000 clearly very thirsty people. Uh, not only <laughs> Maybe that, not she, anymore. Uh, well, she somehow finds time and energy to appear regularly on TV, on social media. She does uh, Instagram and Facebook live sessions every Wednesday evening. And she produces her brilliant Unreserved Wine Talk podcast, which we mentioned. Do check that out. Now, let's get on with the interview. Mm. Uh, Natalie from Ottawa and me in Hampshire, I started by mentioning that we'd just done a Valentine's podcast and we asked people how and when they first fell in love with wine. So I asked her how she first fell in love with wine. Well, there have been many memorable bottles. I think perhaps the first one was a Brunello that uh, my husband and I tasted at an Italian restaurant. But I also have the memory of this magical Rhone Valley Syrah. We had rented a cabin. That was our version of camping. That's as much as I was going to do (laughs) camping wise. And this storm was blowing across the lake in front of the cabin. And I just remember like the windows were rattling and the rain was hitting the tin roof and it was coming down the fireplace and sizzling in the fire. And then we opened up this smoky roan full bodied wine and we were drinking it in front of the fireplace. And I thought, It can rain forever. I don't care. And the more the wind whipped across the lake and the harder it rained, the more I loved that roan. It just filled all my senses. And it was a magical evening. I'll never forget that wine. I think sometimes roan wines really can be overlooked and and underestimated. But but we'd certainly say, yeah, the northern roan is one of our favourite areas for red wine. So that was your kind of moment. Um, One of our very first podcasts was how wine can be a career or a second career. What would you say to people who who maybe love wine and are intrigued by it and are just wondering if they could make a career or a second career like you did out of it? Absolutely. Explore it. I think sometimes folks think, oh, I love this as a hobby. Could I get paid for it? And there are so many possibilities to do that. As you know, Susie, you know, you and I and Peter are, have made a living by being writers or commentators. There's lots of careers out there, tour guides, tasting room personnel, being a winemaker. There's lots of possibilities. I think what it comes down to is you have to think, what do I love? What skills do I have? And what do I enjoy aside from drinking wine? (laughs) And marry those skills up to the skills needed 
for a particular career because it's one thing to love wine and it's a great thing, but you also need to ensure that you have the skills that would be a fit for one of the many careers that are in wine. So continuing sort of on that theme, what would you say, given you moved into wine as a second career, what's been the biggest regret of your career? When I got started, before I even jumped into wine, I didn't have the confidence to go to journalism school. I loved writing. That was my passion, you know, as a going through elementary school and and so on. But I just didn't have the confidence to think I could ever get paid to write. And so I didn't go to journalism school. Instead, I got very practical, got an MBA. (laughs) Uh, We talked about this a little bit when I interviewed you folks on my podcast, Susie. I think there are similar notions that as a woman, you feel you need the credential, in your case, a master of wine, in my case, an MBA, to always know that I could be financially independent, could get a good job, and so on. So I was raised by a, a single mother in Nova Scotia, small town. And she taught me the importance of being financially independent. So I don't regret doing the MBA, but I just wished I'd had the confidence to go for that journalism degree as an undergrad. And on a slightly more positive note, then, what's been your high point, the real high point for you? Well, I think getting past that mental block as a woman. So I know personally, and and women friends have told me, we often discount ourselves out of a job before we even apply for it. And I know I'm generalizing, but, you know, when I went off on maternity leave for the birth of my son about 20 years ago, you know, I wasn't writing, but I'd taken a sommelier diploma program. I knew I loved writing from my job. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to take a flyer. I'm going to take a chance and pitch an article about wine on the internet to a local magazine. So instead of like saying, oh, no, I could not do that. Maybe it was just maternity brain that (laughs) actually made me take that leap. but. I was so glad that I did because that led to my career in writing about wine. And that's why, you know, often when I talk with women, take a chance, even if you don't have all the credentials or everything lined up, just try it and see where it might lead. If you never give it, give it a go, it's never going to happen, is it? So before we talk a bit more about you, which I obviously want to do, I'd love to just ask you about Canada and Canadian wine. And um, you're speaking to us now from Ottawa in Ontario. Now, Voltaire rather unkindly described Canada as a few acres of snow, but I'd like to know how you would describe the country and its wine industry. Sure. Well, I, I, Voltaire, my hat's off to him. He certainly was great in philosophy, but I wouldn't trust him as a travel guide uh, because (laughs) no one would ever visit us. Um, (laughs) So yes, indeed, we do have lots of snow here, but you learn to embrace uh, the weather wherever you are, I think, or else you're just miserable. Personally, I enjoy the great indoors, as I like to tell Miles, my partner. And so rather than being outside skiing and snowshoeing and all the rest of it, I like to have the drinks ready for when everyone comes back from those activities. So I still love where we are. But in terms of the wine industry, certainly that cool climate has a profound effect on the type of wines that we produce. And our industry is relatively small, perhaps like the English wine industry. We have about 700 wineries right now. And we you know, have 31,000 acres of vines planted. Our major regions are Ontario and BC. This has grown yeah. quite a lot recently, hasn't it? Just um, It has. You know, it the has. last sort of 30 years, would you say? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And even in the last five years, the growth has been phenomenal. It seems like every week we hear about a new winery opening in Niagara or the Okanagan Sorry, is that to do with climate change and just everything? I mean, we know it's a cold country. Goodness me, England is cold. We, we know about cold countries. But do you think that it's having an effect and a positive effect? I think it is. Like, for instance, the 2020 vintage was the hottest ever here. And that's happening in a lot of wine regions. It was hot and it was dry. And so the red wines that we produce struggle to produce here, especially the full-bodied ones like Cabernet, ripened beautifully. And it's going to be a banner vintage for big reds. But at the same time, the ice wine harvest, for which we're famous, dropped 30% because winemakers decided not to make ice wine or it didn't get cold enough at Confluence. Of course, COVID has affected duty-free sales in airports, so that's where you buy a lot of your ice wine. But certainly climate change is impacting the decisions, not just 
about, you know, new wineries opening up, but which grapes we're planting and what types of wine we're making here? We don't see nearly enough Canadian wine in the UK, but what we do see can be very impressive. And what would your tips be on what we and our our listeners should be looking out for and trying to buy? I think our specialties are Riesling and Pinot Noir. Ice wine, of course, is a given. It's what we're known for. Luscious, golden elixir dessert wine. But Riesling and Pinot Noir thrive, as you know, Susie, in a cool climate. And we do them so well. They have that nervy, edgy acidity, that vibrancy, that aliveness in the glass that I think makes them wonderful, either on their own or as food partners. So those are the wines that I would look for. I'm not familiar at all with Canadian Riesling. I'm going to admit that freely. Do they tend to be dry or semi-sweet or a mix of the two? They tend to be either dry or just slightly off dry. So there aren't a lot of really sweet styles unless you jump all the way to ice wine. You'll tend to get fairly dry versions here. So coming back to you, Natalie, and your personal experiences, I mean, To be fair, wine and alcohol haven't always been a panacea for you. Um, You mentioned before that your father was an alcoholic. How do you think that experience has shaped your approach to wine? It's had a profound influence. So I grew up in a Scottish East Coast family where wine wasn't even part of the table. It was beer and whiskey. Not that I was drinking it as a child, but wine wasn't part of the culture. And so it wasn't until I got into university, even post-university, that I really started to get into wine and appreciate it. And I think knowing that, you know, there is an allure to wine beyond all of the sort of heady topics we talk about, the way it intersects with so many fascinating subjects, there's also the pure buzz of it. And so I like to say that's the reason we don't have orange juice critics. <laughs> There's something magical about wine and the way it ties everything together and the way it it sort of illuminates all of our senses, including those that love the buzz. And so having a father who was an alcoholic really made me acutely aware of moderation and so on. And I believe now what you know and love and truly understand, you don't abuse And what I mean by that is if you can gain an appreciation for wine, if you can learn about it, I think you can make your way to moderation through that appreciation. It's why I teach wine and food pairing classes online as well. I was going to ask you, that's beautifully put, but um, I was just going to touch a bit further on your family. Your mother and grandmother were teachers. And a big part of what you do is teaching online, uh, particularly food and wine pairing classes. How has the pandemic changed sort of what you do and how people are engaging with it? The pandemic has, I think, made many of us search for ways that we can use our time at home, not just more productively, but more enjoyably, since we're missing those experiences of going out to restaurants and travel and so on. We want to kind of elevate the food and wine experience as much as we can at home. And so what I've noticed is a real uptick on just overall numbers in terms of people enrolling in my courses, but also different people enrolling in them. So what I used to get were a lot of people who couldn't commit to that one night a week, a physical course. Maybe it was because they had kids and they needed the flexibility to stay home or go at their own pace. Perhaps it was people who traveled a lot for business. They, you know, get lots of people checking in from hotel rooms and using the mini bar and (laughs) taking my courses that way. But now it's a much broader swath of people who are looking to take these courses online. And I think it's because they had to get over the mental hurdle that taking wine classes online is something that can be not only effective, but it can be as or more enjoyable than in person. There's some things, of course, we can't replace about in-person tasting, but there's so many more advantages to online courses, whether it is that flexibility or the ability to connect with people around the world who share your passion. So I'm getting a lot more of those people. And then the last group, I would say, I'm getting a lot more of people from the hospitality industry, furloughed or otherwise, who want to sharpen their pairing skills so that they're better able to earn a living when they do get back to working in restaurants. On that note, actually, the the whole food and wine pairing note, I mean, there are people who say it's sophistry, it's smoke and mirrors, a load of old rubbish. What is your response to that? 
Well, I think they are certainly entitled to their opinions, even if I don't agree with them, um, <laughs> obviously. But I think food is a lot less intimidating than wine. So I think we go into a grocery store and we look at roast chicken and we don't start worrying about, oh, which roast chicken am I going to buy? I mean, where did that chicken grow up? Is that chicken from free range or whatever? Perhaps it's because the choices aren't as great as they are in wine. But I think we can bring more people to wine through food first. And that's what I try to do in the courses, but also just on my website, because I think if you know what you love, your taste in food, you can start to explore your taste in wine through those flavors that you're confident of when it comes to eating food. If you could recommend just one really easy and fun food and wine combination for our listeners to try out, what would it be? I like to suggest pairings that don't even require cooking because I'm not a cook myself. There are so many different types of cheeses that go so beautifully with wine and the, the, the combinations are almost infinite. So I would suggest get three of your favorite cheeses, like a creamy cheese, a brie, a cheddar, maybe a blue, whatever it is you like, and maybe crack open a wine or two, depends on how many people are there, and then just mix and match and you will be amazed at the flavor combinations you'll get. And one tip I always say is make sure you try the wine first, then go to the food. You can have the wine in your mouth at the same time if you want to. And then afterwards, go back to the wine. And what happened to the wine? And a lot of people will say, oh my gosh, it's completely changed. You know, it's smoothed out or something happened. And of course we know the wine hasn't changed, but your perception of it has changed. And that's magical for a lot of people to discover that. Absolutely. So what's the weirdest food and wine pairing you've ever had? Okay, I think this is a truly Canadian weird pairing. We have ketchup chips here. I'm not sure if you have ketchup chips in we have uh, England and we oh, have chips. Okay, don't I'm do not that. Sure you have ketchup <laughs> chips. No, exactly. And okay. also our chips, I'm referring to sort of something that's potato that's yes. cut and cooked. Because I know that I've had this experience abroad before where somebody said, Would you like chips? And I end up with a packet of crisps. Oh, it's um, crisps. So, yes. You're right. So okay. Yeah. It's different uh, interpretation of chips. There you go. So I'm talking about ketchup crisps then. Ah. So crisps or chips are chips that are flavored with ketchup. And I thought, wow. I love, I have a weakness for ketchup chips and <laughs> um, it's a, you know, it's Achilles heel, but uh, I thought, well, you know, I know that commercial ketchup is said to have more sugar than ice cream. So I thought, well, ketchup chips, they're going to be sweet. They're going to ruin any dry wine. But I thought, oh, well, for the sake of my readers, listeners, course students, I'm going to try different wines. And what I discovered to my surprise is that these ketchup chips went beautifully with a dry rosé. And the ketchup chips weren't as sweet as I thought. And the sort of strawberry berry flavors of the chips went really well with ketchup. Now, I don't advise trying to slather ketchup over french fries or crisps for that matter and a dry wine i think that would be just cruel to your mouth but this combination worked and it was completely weird and i loved it peter's favorite crisps are sweet chili which is sort of similar they've got a sort of a slightly sweet tomatoey flavor to them so maybe i'll get him to crack open a bottle of rosé and he can try those together and see what he thinks i want to know how that goes <laughs> So finally, um, I mean, it's not just food that this is on food and wine pairing. You, it's not just food that you pair with wine, is it? Give us a sense of some of the other things that you like to pair with wine. We love to pair wine with music, especially while Miles is cooking and I'm pulling corks. And I'll read him bits and pieces of the latest newspaper or magazine. We love to pair it, of course, with binge watching Netflix. So we're binge watching, not binge drinking. But uh, there's so many shows on it. I think uh, we've spent a lot of time doing that during COVID, but you know we love sitting out just in the backyard and watching the sunset. I mean, as, as cliche as that might sound, I just think wine can infuse so many ordinary activities with some sort of special warmth that I think uh, layers in those memories even more, like that cabin in the woods. I think there's just something because you're touching on so many more senses, not just the visual of watching the sunset, but you're, you know, you're tasting, you're feeling the wine, it's seeping through your body. And I, I think that's what makes memories. 
Now, you host, Natalie, your own brilliant podcast. We love it. Unreserved Wine Talk. Um, Why did you decide to start a podcast? I mean, was this a long time ago? I think it probably was, wasn't it? I started near the end of 2018. So it's been almost two years, I guess. But my love of the human voice goes back a lot further back than that. It probably starts with my mother reading to me every night bedtime stories and I'd feel drowsy and all I would hear is her voice. So I was imagining the characters of the book as I got sleepier and sleepier. But then, you know, even as a teenager, I would listen to satellite radio and it would sort of blow in and out across the Atlantic. I was listening to the BBC, Susie, and I just loved their reporting and this whole other world they were talking about. I'm just, you know, imagining it at night because that's when the reception was strongest. So I've always loved the medium, I guess, of the human voice. It's very intimate, as you know, you're millimeters away from someone's brain, your voice. It's like in the dark pillow talk. So that drew me to it, but I didn't get started until about 2018. I think because I had so many other projects on the go, it was always in the back of my mind, but the driving force was definitely that love of the voice. And so tell me now you now you have your own podcast. Tell me something that you you particularly love and equally perhaps don't like so much about podcasting. I love that it allows me to be nosy. So I'm an introvert and I ask questions on podcasts that I would not ask at a dinner party, even an impolite dinner party. <laughs> so I just wouldn't open up that way. And so I love that it allows me into people's lives in a much more like a deeper, more meaningful connection. The conversations you can have on a podcast are just so beyond, oh, what's the weather and so on, as you know. And I think I'm also making up for lost time because I was such an introvert as a child, spent so many hours or years in the corner, not talking at parties that now I'm just, I'm making up for it for sure. In terms of uh, what I found to be a challenge or don't like about podcasting is We're in a very um, technical field, you could say, Susie, in that you can get a lot of the facts wrong about wine from whatever, the type of oak to whatever. I don't focus on the technical aspects of wine on my podcast because I love storytelling and I love to get two people's stories. But that said, there's a minefield of facts you can get wrong. And so what I had to do is get past my own fear of looking stupid or my own fear of what will people think? She's been writing about wine for 20 years and she doesn't know that. And so, you know, I have to retreat into reassure myself that I always will be an enthusiastic amateur and that's the best service I can be for my listener. Lots of my listeners won't know those facts either. I guess the way where you're probably never imperfect is when you're writing your books. And I just wanted to briefly ask you about that. You've already written two books. You're on your third book now, which is a memoir. How is it different then from your two previous books and what can we expect? Well, a memoir is a different type of animal I've I've learned in trying to write this one or as I still progress in writing it in that, of course, it's very personal. The first two books I did write from a first person perspective. They were all stories about gallivanting around the world and meeting odd winemakers and learning about wine through their stories. But now, you know, I'm turning the camera on myself. That's what a memoir is. And it's very exposing. (laughs) It can make you feel very vulnerable. But I think that's a good challenge to try to understand who you are and why you did what you did. And I think people can still learn lots about wine but now it's from a much more intimate perspective. And the one thing that I had to learn was almost thinking about it like a movie script. So you have your opening shot or your establishing shot. You have to think in scenes as opposed to just one long exposition of, I did this, I did that. Like no one wants to read that. People want to be engaged almost as though they're watching a movie. So even if they don't know you, They can identify with conflict. You know, during this book, I got divorced. During this book, I suffered from depression. During this book, I had to deal with alcohol consumption. And so those major themes are just human themes, but trying to shape the narrative as scene after scene after scene, as opposed to one long explanation is the challenge. So finally, if you could give one tip to our listeners, what would it be? 
just keep experimenting. So one of the things that I advise my students to do is when you go into a liquor store, I know it can be intimidating, but just buy a mixed case of wines instead of always trying to find the one perfect wine or the one perfect pairing. And don't be afraid to ask the liquor store staff. Say, I like this particular Rhone Syrah. What would you recommend in this price range, in this style? And maybe they'll take you to, who knows, an Argentine Malbec and just broaden your horizons or maybe different wineries in the Rhone and just de-risk the whole thing by getting a mixed case and then experiment and, and find some new favorites. Natalie McLean, thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, Susie, this was a pure delight. So a couple of things to to pick up on there. Uh, Firstly, we should just clarify about our shows we mentioned at the start of the interview. Our Wine as a Career episode was Series 1, Episode 2, and our Valentine's podcast was our last one, uh, Series 2, Episode 8, in case you'd like to listen in if you haven't already. But also, I I thought interesting to hear Natalie encouraging women to have the courage of their convictions in terms of a a career in wine and to to just Mm. aim high. I mean, I absolutely agree with that. I really mm-hmm. would. I also really liked her, her take on on moderation through appreciation. Yeah. I think that's a really lovely yeah. way of putting it. It is actually. It's a lovely, lovely turn of phrase and, and, and contains a very serious truth in there. Uh, but on a more lighthearted note, and I can, you know, it's hard to know where to start. There's so much to pick There's up There's a lot on. to pick up but, on, yeah. um, when, when Natalie mentioned the Netflix binge watching and oh, wine, yeah, yeah. it definitely did make me think that of your suggestion to Wine GB, who'd asked as part of a social media campaign wasn't it Um, yeah for a fun combination of a netflix show with an english wine and you suggested the queen's gambit Mm -hmm. didn't you with with kits coty chardonnay yeah yeah i mean i I, I think well i think i said they both (laughs) offer a life-affirming story of triumph over adversity that sounds like it should be read by a man with a very gravel voice and life's (laughs) it was i think it was a bit dramatic but but you know my point was my point was that beth Harmon, uh, the main character in the queen's gambit who everybody will know if they've they've seen it it's a brilliant show by the way if you Mm. haven't do watch yeah. it. Um, but somehow she manages to kind of overcome uh, loss, mm. addiction, and then a lot of patronising men to become world chess champion. Yeah, it's um, great, it's I mean, amazing. And, and at the same time, what I was trying to say was England is hardly the easiest place to grow great grapes and make mm. world-class wine, but people like Chapel Down are doing it. And I think more important than all of that, and my main point was that you can enjoy both of these things without being an expert in either chess or wine. They're just both very yeah. enjoyable and particularly when you put them together. So I there you go. I can't fault Kits your logic. And the Queen's I see Gambit. what you've done there. There we are. Uh, that's another it's, it's great, great uh, pairing there. And we, we also talking about pairing, we did want to pick up very briefly on some more specific um, cheese and wine yeah, pairing I mean, suggestions, didn't we? Which we touched on briefly, mm, Natalie, but we didn't sort of mention Well, this is, this so. is something isn't it, that we just really love actually yeah, don't yeah. we so we, we couldn't resist actually picking up on it just to give you a bit more detail just on our favorites we would suggest trying a really nutty rich but savory white wine or a dry amontillado sherry i know they sound different but they they work in a similar way with a really really hard flavorsome cheese and we personally like aged gruyere we love truffle pecorino and we love burkswell which is a used milk cheese from warwickshire and it is Delicious. Or a good um, cheddar. Or a good cheddar, yeah, a really good Montgomery's Keen, something like that. But another option would be a, a very nice fresh goat's cheese with, with a great Sauvignon Blanc, mm, which I think classic. is a classic match. Yeah. And then finally, just a bit of decadence, a creamy, salty, perhaps a little bit runny blue with Canadian ice wine. See, that, that both terrifies me and excites me oh. that much. Lovely. But it, it does. It would, it would kill or cure, wouldn't it? <laughs> Especially this time of year. So, yeah, I think that's all we've got time for on this episode. Thank you very much to Natalie. Uh, do check out her Unreserved Wine Talk podcast and her website too. Thanks also to Vinum for this week's wines and to Mission Hill. Absolutely. And if you need something fun to do this weekend, don't we all? Why not try a nice wine? It may just change your life. <laughs> Who knows? Until next time, stay safe. Thanks for listening and cheers. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Susie Berry. In the show notes, you'll find a full transcript of our conversation, 
how you can join me in a free online wine and food pairing class, links to where you can buy both my books or one or the other. And if you do, by the way, I'd be happy to send you a personalized signed book plate. That's whether you're buying the books now or you have them on hand at home. Just email me. You'll also find in the show notes where you can find me on Zoom, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube live video every Wednesday at 7 p.m., including this evening and next week. That's all in the show notes at nataliemcclain.com forward slash 134. You won't want to miss next week when I chat with Céline Boissard, a New York-based freelance writer, editor, photographer, and digital media specialist in the wine and spirits spaces, and particularly their socio-political dynamics. She's a smart cookie, and she's been published in Eater, Wine Enthusiast, Billboard, Harper's Bazaar, Town and Country, and many more. Now, in the meantime, if you missed episode 36, go back and take a listen. We're starting to get back into traveling, yay! And in this episode, I chat about airline wine, lights of wine that you can drink without reservations. <laughs> I'll share a short clip with you now to whet your appetite. Getting a wine to taste delicious at 30,000 feet isn't easy. After a few hours, we get dehydrated. Alcohol's dehydrating effect compounds this, and we lose up to 30% of our ability to taste. Wine's aromas are flattened, and any element that's out of balance, such as tannin or acidity, is emphasized. The wine hasn't changed. We have. My dream flight begins with the wine selection. We'd like to direct your attention to the wine list in the seat pocket in front of you, says the airline attendant. You'll note that we have a fine selection of first-growth Bordeaux at the rear of the plane, and a 40-year vintage of port is being decanted in the middle aisles. And for our first-class passengers, we have a vertical of Chateau Cam 1945 through 1960 at the front of the plane. If you like this episode, please tell one friend about it this week, especially someone you know who'd be interested in the tips that I shared. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week. Perhaps a wine that pairs beautifully with ketchup chips. don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemcclain.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.